Okay, I had oh. to push a button. So, this, so which page mean? is it going on now? I'm sorry? I said, so which page are you putting it on now? Because I just... On the Ninja Network public page. And does that mean that my entire... Um, yes. Got missed? <laughs> Your entire blur. I talked for the last five minutes and it wasn't there. Good for me. Well, well it was for us and it will be for yeah. the for the recording, so people will catch up. Yeah. The recording isn't what goes on the live. Oh. It's normally live and we leave it there. We don't post the recording on the live. Okay. So and we have some people joining us now on the live. Yeah, it, it is it is now live. It's amazing how that works. It's amazing how it works when you actually are live. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. I hmm. can't believe that I missed that. So do you want to do a quick synopsis then? <laughs> how can I do? Does someone else want to do a quick synopsis? Sorry, did you just ask Juliet to do a quick synopsis? <laughs> Tiffany, is that what you said? Steve, you're really good at summarizing and shortening my phrases. So yeah, why my, don't you take my, So is my, Steve your my, baby? Mine, mine will be too short. Yours will be too short? My, well, okay. mine will be, what the hell is everybody worried about? By the time you guys are all finished arguing about this, you could have just said it again, Juliet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. I'll do a shortened version of it. Okay. So welcome to a delayed version of <laughs> Whiskey Wednesday. We had a little bit of a late start because I thought we were live, but apparently we weren't live. Um, cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So our topic for tonight is going to center around the hot topic in the industry and in the Facebook groups right now, which is talking about what app price increases do to our business, um, our workflows, how they affect us. Um, a lot of people are looking to move off of and the, and the um, <coughs> example that's taking place in the industry right now is Pluto. So a lot of people have been talking about moving off of Pluto and moving to a different um, accounts payable, third party application, either for accounts payable or for receivables because of the new $25 a month um, fee increase that Pluto announced last week. So we wanna talk about, um, and, and I mentioned this already about eight minutes ago, <laughs> that we use Pluto in our own business, um, have been using it for about, th about three years, I'm gonna say, and it's one of the core apps, not only for ourselves, but for our clients. And we're not looking to move our clients off the platform. And I'm not looking to move them off for a couple of reasons. One is that um, more than anything is we have developed all these process, internal processes and workflows and documentation around this application that we've been using for the last three years. And our clients love it. We love it. Um, but more than anything else, our clients and our team know it. So we now, everything runs smoothly. When you first introduce an app for your team, it's really bumpy because they have to learn how to troubleshoot it. They, I mean, nothing ever works the way it's supposed to in an ideal world. And so, um, so our, the learning curve for my team to be able to move everyone and to be able to help our clients when they're learning this new program is a lot of work. So the topic for tonight is um, talking about what app increases are going to do, you know, to affect our business, because this is the first one. There's going to be more. We're going to see more. Um, and if you move to another program or another application, what if in six months they increase their price? They see that, you know, the Pluto uh, monthly business model works really well. So they decide to do the same thing. So where, where does that leave you? Are you then going to move all your clients again in six months? So that's kind of the topic for tonight. Um, so now, that was a shorter version, right? <laughs> okay. So let's have, some, let's have someone else talk. I've been talking for like the last 11 minutes. So what are initial thoughts? I guess, is it affecting you, Tiffany, or Jacqueline? Mm, no, most, most of my clients are still too. with Jack. With checks, okay. I print out the checks, hand them, they sign it, they distribute where they go. That's most of my clients still. Okay. 
How about you, Tiffany? Um, so I'm not a Pluto user, but I don't think this discussion really needs to center around Pluto. Uh, we don't want to keep berating them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a business decision that they've made. And if that business decision is going to be one that makes them around longer, then I'm all for that. You know, everybody's got to make their money and they've got to have the money available for doing development as well. So I guess the question more is, you know, what are your just what what are your deciding factors? You need to look at, you know, it, like you said, that your process is in the learning curve and that sort of thing. But it, I wouldn't necessarily say that that is a reason not to change. Um, I think you just need to be looking at it and doing a needs assessment for yourself and for your clients. Okay, so. Um... If, if you think about it from the perspective, so how many apps are typically in a core stack for a business? Like are, are most people narrowing it down and supporting three or four um, applications, third-party apps that they use across the board, or do they go by, you know, the client needs this, so I bring it in and they have like 10. I think that's also a deciding factor. Like, do you have clients that are on, you know, three different accounts payable processing systems? Yeah, exactly. And again, that, that's going to be all based on the model of your own firm, right? I mean, you know, some like yourself who does a lot of the bookkeeping stuff and you're actually doing full service bookkeeping for all of your clients, then that's going to be different than say my firm that supports clients in really trying to be their own advocates for their bookkeeping. Um, I do do some of the, do do, <laughs> I said do do. Um, I do do some bookkeeping for clients, um, but my model is more of supporting them and training them and teaching them to grow. Okay. And then once they're at a point where they don't wanna handle it, then I will handle it. But it, I feel that it's super important for businesses to have a handle on their finances and on their operations and learn from it in order for them to grow. And, you know, just from my experience and what my clients do is it's, it's an exponential growth if when, I, when we work with that type of a model versus them just giving me everything to be, you know, key myself. Okay. So Bianca commented in the chat, um, billing for software and services separately. So does that mean that there is no impact on you just on your client um, because you're breaking out the service or the software, you know, your services stay the same, but the software costs increase so that the impact is really only on the client. And if that's the scenario, then how many clients are not going to want to pay the monthly fee or again, the increase, are they going to say, you know, this is app is just getting too expensive for me. I don't want to use it anymore. And what does that mean for your business model? More than anything else, we want to center the discussion, again, as Tiffany said, not around Pluto, but around um, these third-party programs that we're building our businesses on that, yes, we can support and yes, we can, you know, um, we can troubleshoot this for you and it'll save you money and it'll save you time and it'll automate and give you real-time bookkeeping. But what happens when the app makes a change? I mean, Intuit announced a price increase, you know, for QBO. I don't hear a lot of people saying, well, I'm going to a different accounting system. Is it that, and I'm sure there will be, there will be some people that will, but I guess what is the value to what it is that the application does in conjunction with the software? Um, so any, any thoughts? Steve, you're really quiet and you weren't quiet when we were talking about this topic earlier. I'm a quiet guy. Oh, my room's be getting darker. Hold on a second. I need to turn on the light. I'm not sure that that light gives a lot of light. <laughs> Let's see if there's any change. This should be interesting. There we go. Well, you guys can keep talking while I'm turning on another light. Did anyone see any difference at all? No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I rest my cake. Oh, 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 oh there okay. we go. Oh, now you've, what you do, shine it over under your chair? No, my lamp was off, but it was unplugged. That's why I turned it on, but it wasn't plugged in. 
No, I, I mean, I think, you know, price increases are a fact of business, right? I mean, it's certainly not unique to our uh, industry. Um, and it's never going to change, right? I mean, uh, I think more than anything, you need to look at what your business model is and that when a a third party app or a third party supplier that is critical to your business is going to have a price increase, how is that going to affect your business? You know, it, for example, if you're going to build your services and software separately, or you're going to have the client build the soft, uh, pay for the soft, the software, then whenever there's a price increase, you're going to have to babysit your client and you're going to have to deal with your client crying to you that, you know, okay, so what do we do now? What are my options? You know, is there a cheaper option? You're going to have to deal with that because you're having your client pay. If you do or have a pricing model that is flat fee or value pricing, where the fee includes everything, then the client's never going to know, right? Because you're the one who's paying for all of the the additional costs and it's all built into your pricing. So I, I think we're going to see, when I saw all of this discussion, let's say on Facebook, I just found it very interesting because you could more or less pick out what someone's business model probably was based upon how they reacted to the price increase. So you think that the and and, and again I'm I'm not saying either one is right or wrong. Right. You create your business model the way you want to create it for you. But I am just saying price increases are a fact of life, and I, and I think the comment you made, Juliet, uh, as much as I hate to agree with you, but um, <laughs> but I, I I think you're right. You know that you can't. It's, it's recorded that I'm right. Yes, yes, please, <laughs> please make a note. Um, you know, you, I think that is poor business practice to change suppliers, let's say, every time there's a price adjustment. And I'm not suggesting that's what's going to happen, but it did quite astound me how quickly everyone seemed to want to jump off the Pluto bandwagon that's just that was just my observation not saying right wrong good bad but it, it did surprise me and again i must admit that my first reaction was okay where can we move to for all of our clients and then i took a step back and thought okay so technically let's assume that my clients don't use the um the international payments and they only use the 10 domestic so, okay, so it's costing me or my client an extra $15 a month. Okay, so how long will it take me to move everything that's already established, reconnect all those suppliers to a new payroll payment system, train my team, train my clients? Is it worth $15 a month per client to me? And I thought, okay, well, it's a no brainer for me. Um, but again, that's our business model and also, you know, that there's a team that needs to be trained and brought up to speed. Um, and I forgot what my point was. <laughs> I know there was one, but. So um, I guess an art for me, this change is another argument for considering your app stack priced outside of your value, because I don't want my value tied to somebody else's business decision. So yeah. similar to where HST was added into, or GST was added into Canada when we were at, when, when they decided to make the change that now all services included HST for Ontario's sake, automatically it was an 8% increase in what my clients had to pay. That was not me, but if I had, you know, say priced it and said everything was all included, then I'm being you know, penalized for somebody else's business decision. So I guess that this is, for me, it's, it's another argument for separating it outside. Now, again, my business model is different than, say, somebody who is doing a full-service bookkeeping and they're just doing, 
you know, five, six, a thousand dollars a month for their service, including everything. For me, again, I don't feel that my value should be tied to an app. So where if my client is paying for that, just like, like telephone service, if Kojiko yep. or Bell decided to have a big increase, it is then my responsibility as an advisor to my client to maybe do a needs assessment and maybe look outside and look for other options. So for me, that's another value add service that I'm providing. And that's an add on fee that I charge my clients for doing the needs assessment. So where somebody, another business is doing a, uh, an increase and I have to do an assessment for that client, it's another billable service that I can do that they, if I had included it in my service, they wouldn't realize because I would be the one eating it out of my bottom line. Yeah. If that That's makes any sense. Yeah. Um, as to, I'm curious as to whether anyone else is taking advantage of this opportunity to introduce a new service offering that, okay, you know, you don't want to pay the $25 a month for Pluto. We've done the setup for you. We've done all the, um, you know, the, the uh, heavy lifting on Pluto. If you want us to look at other options for you, we can certainly do that. Here's the fee for us to do the research. And then if you decide to move platforms, here's the fee to move platforms. Mm -hmm. Interesting concept. And Nobody for me, it's providing them the, with, with their new policies and procedures as well around yeah. that whole thing. But again, I have a slightly different model in that I'm not absolutely doing everything. I'm working with the client and having them do their own stuff. So I'm like their, their offsite CFO or their trainer or their accounting manager and allowing them to do their bookkeeping. And I guess from our perspective, so if I'm looking at from our business model, the challenge that I think I would face with it is that they went with Pluto on our recommendation, right? We were the ones that said, hey, this is gonna make your life easier. And it has made our li their lives easier. You know, we had clients who um, would plan their vacations around payroll because they had to sign paychecks um, and they had to sign, you know, subcontractor checks every other Friday. And now they can take vacations whenever they want because they can remit or send the, approve the payments from their phone. But, uh, but no, that's an interesting, um, an interesting thought. I haven't really thought about that. So then why would you bear the burden of their convenience? Yeah. Because if they decide, you know, because you're working well with them and you're helping them and they're growing. And at some point, you know, they're so large that they need to have their own internal accounting system. You need to be able to pass that service off. Yeah. So then now you're kind of giving up your secret sauce for some, you know, in some cases, like if you're using other things that are like your own back office stuff. But yeah. I mean, for me, I'm very transparent to my clients. This is what it is. Here's your, your, your stack. I'm not responsible where I can actually have the client charge like wage point and that sort of stuff. They pay for it. I don't want to have that burden. So then if they decide to hire 50 new staff, I don't then have to, Oh my gosh, which clients have now just done something differently. And I now need to price differently. Yeah. And I know that um, there's been a lot of discussion about which apps do you pay for that you build into your value pricing? Which ones do you have the client pay for? And a lot of people have started, you know, breaking it out um, into two lines on their invoice. So they're still doing the collecting so that they get whatever discounts are offered and can pass them on. Um, but no, absolutely. Uh, that's a great point. Interesting. Any other, any other thoughts? I don't have any other comments, I don't think so. Um, Jaretta says that she, her clients use Beanworks, which is out of Vancouver, I believe. Um, she's asking if there's any feedback on the platform. We looked at it, I think, for one client um, and decided that because our app stack, we try and keep it really small and make sure that, you know, it's something that we can scale across clients, never went ahead with it. Um, so I'm not able to give you any feedback on how they compare. Um, I'm not sure if Jacqueline or Tiffany you're able to, or if anyone else that's chatting, that's watching can, or perhaps in the comments later. Um, My understanding is that Beanworks works, works very well with higher volume clients because it is, it is a, a pretty expensive, but it's also very 
very sophisticated payable system. Like yeah, it's something that I would, I recommend to my large, like 18, $20 million charities. Okay. Yeah. I think it does approvals um, on the bill level before the payment, whereas Pluto is the payment side is where the approval takes place. So if you have multiple levels, so I'm not sure that they are necessarily comparable other than just the payment um, that I was allowed to do. And it's Matthew joining us. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Hello, hello. Um, okay, so I don't know if, if Matthew, you're affected at all um, by the, the Pluto increase that's coming out. I don't think Pluto is as big in the US. I know there are some people that use it, but I don't know if the monthly fee is the same down there. Um, no, we said it was no longer a planet quite a few years ago. Okay. Okay. But no, Bob, I, um, I, don't, I don't use it, so I don't know. I'm not much help, I'm sorry. But it's no, no different than QB uh, QuickBooks Advance and what you guys had to go through where QuickBooks was limited to their, the, the number of transactions and classes and stuff. And then you guys had to make a decision as to whether to go to advance or to switch up. So it's, it's no different, right? It's just, it's decision, different. <laughs> air quotes, decision. Yes. <laughs> it's just a different app. And again, I think that's part of the reason that we wanted to talk about it because although Pluto may be the first one that we've seen in a while, um, I, it's not gonna be the last. And how are we all going to handle it? Um, and how are we gonna deal with it in our own practices? That really more than anything else is, is the purpose of the conversation. Um, so, uh, you know, from, from our perspective, just from the team perspective, I know that the first, when I was talking to our team about it in our team meeting, I mean, the looks on everybody's face about having to learn a new app um, almost made me cry that, you know, nobody wants to do that because we now have, you know, very little downtime in having to learn the app or troubleshoot an app because we've been using it for a while. So having to switch, you know, doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't, isn't, it's not necessarily good for business, for our business, even if it is not you know, even if it's good for our clients, it's not good necessarily for our business. Um, and that's, I guess, me off my soapbox. I'll come off my soapbox now. I agree with you. Um, and we've had a couple aspects that kind of relate to this. Recently, I don't know, maybe we're the only ones that got hit by this, but we recently, we've been helping a couple of our clients transition into different corporate structures which has required us to set up a whole new company file and a whole new merchant processing account. And while doing this, the, apparently there are new policies in place with Intuit merchant, um, uh, merchant processing onto the limits that they do initially with an account and the, basically where this, these accounts had established amounts prior, but then they automatically started with super low rates and it's caused this transition because of somebody else's change of something, it's actually caused hiccups within our client's company files. Like literally they would get to part in a day, they couldn't run transactions anymore. So what happened? What did they tell the person, hey, I trust you, come back tomorrow and pay me? Or did that person have to split it up over multiple payments? Like that's one example. And then I think more directly, you're talking about just the, the, the price increases and these dramatic changes that are happening across the board, right? Um, that's where I've been raving for some time now about a paragraph that we added into our service contracts that literally say we, um, from time to time, third-party applications will increase the price of their application. Um, when this occurs, we will take the retail price uh, less the previous retail price and the difference between the two will be the increase in your cost of your, in your monthly uh, billing. So we've done it that way. So it's recognized our service part didn't change, but we, we can't keep eating it because we lost our rear over the last year and a half on this stuff. Can't. And, and have you found that your, your clients have said, okay, well that price increase on that software is too high. I need you to switch me to another, another app or another. So no one has. So, no. so why is it that that everyone in the industry thinks that their clients can't pick up this increase. 
I would imagine that part of it is because as people are value pricing and it's, it's embedded in there and it's going to be affecting your bottom line because you're eating it, that price increase is eating out of your cost. But or, with, sorry, eating out of your revenue. But with Pluto in the past, there was no monthly fee, right? It was per transaction. And I'm not sure most people would include transaction fees in their value pricing. It's like bank service charges. Why would you eat that or absorb it at all? Then why is it a big issue? I mean, if you're not going to be like get the client to pay the 25 bucks then. I guess that's a, a question. Is it, and I think that as, as bookkeepers, accounting professionals, accountants in the industry, we tend to be more price sensitive than our clients do. Because we're cheap. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm trying to be really diplomatic. <laughs> um, you gotta tell it like it is, sister. It's that that yeah. translates between Canadian and American exactly the same. Even that exchange rate is the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, are we just assuming that our clients are going to say, well, no, that's $25 is just too much. Um, I do a needs assessment. Like I would look at that and go, okay, well, that 25 bucks a month is now whatever it's going to cost additionally. So here's your option. You can pay that or you can pay me at $150 an hour to do a needs assessment on another app, learn it, teach you, set up new policies and procedures. So you could have paid $600 or you could pay $6,000. What would you like? I will, I will say that I literally was just talking to a friend that works in software development and we were discussing how all the different price increases, it's, it's not like a one little price increase that really bugs people. I gave the analogy of when I was in car audio and I would deliver a vehicle that was all done and the car sounds great and I'm super excited, right? But the guy who did the install forgot to vacuum the front, you know, where the, the front feet area. Oh, and by the way, also the door panel, there was a little panel pop. Nothing was wrong. You just didn't get pushed on quite right. And then, oh, and you know, you check your stereo right and left. Those were backwards. Each one of those examples are stupid little things that would take five minutes max to fix. But when you add them all together, it becomes a big, huge snowball chasing you down a hill. And that is where we start to get frustrated and we get irritated by it because we're not dealing with, like, you're not dealing with this issue with just Pluto. You're dealing with a lot of different things all the way around. A big part of it, like in California, we're on our way to $15 an hour minimum wage. So bottom line, like everything is continuing to go up all the time. And while I do agree and support we need a better minimum wage, what it does is it, it literally causes every place you go to, restaurants have to charge more. Everybody has to charge more. So it's, it's like we're creating our own inflation on that side of it. It's ridiculous. I was so, in a restaurant in California and I had to pay a fee for the fact that they had to upcharge to a specific rate. It was on the bill about they, they yeah. it had to do with minimum wage and we Francisco. paid a yeah, it was a fee. I'm like, I have never seen this before that we were paying the upcharge on the minimum wage in the restaurant. Uh, because they were passing it through to us, which yeah, is- Yeah, exactly. And they put a line item for it. So, so really yeah. the cost of an app, how is that any different than when your, your liability insurance increases? So that, that new policy p thing comes in, you look at it, oh, it's an 8.9% increase. I could think that I'm gonna go shop around or <laughs> or if it's a 2% increase, then it's like, well, you know what? The cost of switching insurance companies is not worth it. Yeah. It's worth the relationship, right? But mm -hmm. do we have relationships with the software companies? True relationships where they're actually like backing us and they, you know, they, if there's a problem, they get it taken care of real quick. Like, how is that relationship? Does State Farm do that? Does economical <laughs> insurance do that? Do they back you really? Or do they no, try to cancel your insurance have the first big claim that you have? Good point. I mean, Ventura, they literally just dropped 35 or 30,000 policies because of fire hazard and all that stuff. But I have a relationship with my agent who comes by once a year and says, Hey buddy, how are you? 
as so he cool. takes your money as he gets this little commission every year. Those are the people that have the most money. When I first started going to a country club a long time ago, my first experience, and I asked what everybody did, and everybody's like, insurance agent, insurance. So they weren't working, they were playing golf, and I'm like, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> they were all in their 40s, and they were all playing golf, I guess probably writing it off, I don't know, and I'm like, wow, because they can make money in the policies. But getting back to your point on the apps, I did not, the first year that QuickBooks went up, and I had, I don't know, maybe 25 bookkeeping clients that I had them on my wholesale. I said, that's $5, no big deal, right? But it's $5 per client per month. That is a big deal. But I was like, I can't go back to my clients and really, I don't want to nickel and dime them, right? The second year I sat there going, oh, another $10 increase, which is $5 on my site. Same thing. I just let it go. This year, I'm like, not doing it this year. That I'm done. And I let them all know. But now I raise them up to cover it. And they all were like, what is going on? I got so many people yelling at me. And I'm like, it's not me. And I even raised my rate, which I should have. I raised the rate because it covered the app cost. They said, look, I ate it for two years. You should be thanking me for eating it for two full years and not going back to you. And I, 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 I don't want to do it anymore. I really don't. I, I'm actually to the point now, except for that QB Live link that's in the subscriptions, I'm actually at the point now where I sit back and go, you know what, pay your own. Because you're not going to call into it and yell. First of all, you'd be on hold for a half an hour, but you're not going to call them and yell about the $10. It's going to come every year. We know that now. They've established a pattern. Heck, I do it with my rents. Same thing with the rental property I have up north. We give them a little increase every year. And at first it was a lot of yelling. And then after that, all the new people just like, oh, here comes my $10 or whatever the percentages that we do. And now it's like expected. <laughs> That's what I should do. <laughs> and I guess more than anything, it is the surprise that I've seen as to how many people are looking to move um, so quickly. Yeah. Um, it's talk. They're not going to move. I, how many people have you heard? I'm going to go to zero. Yeah, go ahead. See how well it is to go switch to zero. You got to learn a whole new accounting platform. And not I, only I, you, your clients have to. Yes. Like, and, let's be real about that. Like you're talking about restructuring your, if, if you're literally going to go from this to that program, whatever it is, the big one out there is accounting suite, nothing against accounting suite. The smartest thing in the world to do, build an app that's going to actually help you go from accounting suite back to QBO. So if they find out they don't like it, they can actually go back very easily. There's moneymaker. Okay. Go ahead, do it. Trademark me. <laughs> Doing but, your first free time. <laughs> and I think more than anything, this, this increase with Pluto has brought to light that we need to think about it. You know, we need to think about it from our business perspective as to, you know, how we want our business model to run and what is the, what are the key things that are going to be important to us as these, and we're going to see this over and over and over again. The app partners are going to raise their prices. Um, and to your question, you know, Matthew, as to whether or not we have relationships with the app partners, that support us. Absolutely, some of them we do, some of them you don't. But the relationships that you have are with your clients. And if you're flipping from this app to this app to this app that accomplishes the same thing for your client, how frustrated is your client going to be? Yeah. You know, well, you recommended this, I've been on it, I like it, but now you're telling me that I need to go here instead. Um, yep. So, you know, how and does you that affect one bad you? Recommendation. You give one bad recommendation, they remember forever. I re like literally years back, I when projects just came out, I tried to get an interior designer set up on it and it wasn't ready yet. Still, like still to this day, I do not ever mention that word around her <laughs> ever. And it's awesome. But and it's probably better for her now, but it was crappy back then. And yeah, it's really great now, but you probably can never convince her of that. Never. <laughs> Well, and I'm sure that most people, when they recommend an app or they introduce an app into their app stack, they've done their homework. They've done their due diligence that, you know, they've been around for a while. There's tons of articles out there, you know, how to choose your app stack. Um, they've done their due diligence. They've, they've tested it. I mean, we tested internally on our own books before we ever recommend it and roll it out to anybody. So again, um, I, I think that that what is that due diligence worth for you to have to do it again for another for another program? Well, quickly, gotta give a shout out and apology to Adam out there. I offended him with my comment. Oh, he's on the yeah, he's Sorry, on Batman. Facebook. Sorry, Batman. Batman. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Where, which comment was it, Matthew? I think I it was about the accounting. You mentioned that. Accounting I'm pretty suite. sure it was about accounting suite. He, <laughs> he likes that product. So 
No, I, I think price increases from suppliers are a very another good lesson for every business owner why you should increase your price every year. Yeah. To your clients. Right. I mean, I think it's almost unforgivable to own a business and not increase your prices on some service or another every year. You're right. Because the, the, and like Linda said, right, the, the problem I would I would guess, Linda, with the price increase and, and stuff, because I've been super guilty of this. If I didn't raise my price in a couple of years, now I'm so far behind, I have to do a dramatic increase. And we talked about that earlier. If we're talking a 2% versus a 10%, that's fundamentally yep. a totally different deal. Yep. So um, I've definitely been guilty of that one. And me too. I mean, I told you I was going, I, you know, I've been going through all my accounts and I'm like, wow, December of 2016. And I brought the conversation up with the client. That was, a, he's my, I never changed the price since then. And the, the, he's on plus. Yeah. And I brought the conversation up and you know what his answer was? Oh, I don't want to pay any more for that. You know what? Maybe I'll do it myself. Catch me up because he, he's another one that doesn't give me his statements and I have to beg for them because he's on a, a bank that you can't get them. Catch me up and um, I might do it myself. You know what I want to say? <laughs> Catch yourself up. <laughs> I'm all done. But I was like, no, nope. nice. Linda was like, no, I'll catch you up. I'll let you know. And you go for it because you know what? I'm making no money off your account. It's not worth it. I think I'm actually losing. So when I start to factor my time on, I know I'm losing. So I like him as a person. He's been with me since December of 2016. He's not like the oldest client, but you know, he, and I, but that was my first, that was my only conversation we ever talked about anything. And he's, yeah. So, you know what? I'm sorry. And that's why I'm making so why a pricing page too on my, on my website. I want people to know the bottom line. If you're losing money on him, why are you even catching him up? Um, because he's paid me now for, I've been begging on boomerang. So I shouldn't say it's begging because I just keep boomeranging. Can I answer for you, Linda? <laughs> what do you say? Can I answer for you? Go ahead. Because Linda is one of the nicest people I know out there. And she always tries to do everything she possibly can to help people and make sure that people are happy with her services. And it's actually been because of recently she she helped motivate me to do this as well, that we've been evaluating per client, literally like project based uh, cost that we've both discovered some of this stuff and she just wants to, to conclude it the right way. So and what did I tell you I was going to do on New Year's Eve? Stop being nice. <laughs> and what did you say? Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk to me tomorrow. <laughs> and you don't need to stop being nice, but you can't, I mean, you're still a business. You're still a business that has to run, just like he's a business that has to run. So, okay. Plus, well, so I know he raises rates. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> we're yeah. not transparent here. <laughs> I think they forget that, right? I think clients literally forget that sometimes. Like, look, Mr. Customer, I can see that you're having twice as, uh, your year is twice as profitable this year. Guess it what? Was <laughs> That's the funny part. Like, I love Chris Reagan's model about you base the price on their revenue, unless they're just like they're in they're in, in the red. Then you base it on their expenses. But the pricing model goes by what they what their revenue is. So if their revenue goes up, my price comes up. I don't know how well that works. I would love to implement that. And if you hit a recession and you now need to do more work with them, your price goes down. It goes down if your income, if your revenue goes down, but it, sometimes like I got a client right now that it's the opposite. Like I'd have to go, well, your expenses are here, but yeah, that's how it works. That's how his plan works. I mean, I know. The one way street, Tiffany, one way street. That's right. It always goes up. It never goes down. <laughs> and that's completely opposite of value pricing, right? Because if you're, if you're pricing based on a revenue metric, then you're not value pricing. But I'm working with attorneys, so we're re we don't have the recession thing. It goes on too much. I mean, it will happen, but it won't happen in the extent of going like with a contractor, you know, that I've lived the contractor roller coaster because it, especially, you know, in Rhode Island, it went down. So, but with the, with the attorneys, one of the reasons why I picked them over some of the other industries is because, A, I like getting my ask them for documents, you get them fast, but also because they're somewhat recession proof. No business is recession proof, but yeah. Okay, cool. Any other comments that anyone has on, 
and maybe we talk app stacks. So one of the things that Bianca said is that not one of her clients uses the same tech stack. So in our, in our company, it's standard. Here's your tech stack. This is what we use. Um, is that typical? No. <laughs> Depends if you're in a niche or not. If you're in a niche, probably very possible or probable. If you're not, if you're a generalist, there's going to be differences because look, I can't use Noify for a marketing company. Mm -hmm. Right. Like but do you have a core tech stack, like your, um, like, like your hub doc or receipt bank? Yeah, like the things that every business, regardless of what industry they're in, needs to have, like your payroll, or do you support six payroll software programs? And Which, if again one of them increases their fees, do you then say, well, I know this other program already because we use it with the other client, so I can move all my clients over. Personally, we use vendor sync with every client. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? The vendor sync again? Why? What is that again? <laughs> why oh, what about that? other other apps? Yeah, why is that, Matthew? Is it a really good app that we should know about? You don't already? I tell you what, why don't I do a live demonstration? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, to answer your true question, so the way I would go about that is, yeah, we do. It's QuickBooks Online, right? So, I mean, yeah. that's the fundamental core of it. It's generally like when it comes to apps, apps are a way to actually standardize your clients also. Let them have their chaos in the app so you can have the quality of numbers if you set it up correctly in your books. Um, from there, like if I had to choose, I mean, we really don't have a, a straight like grouping that everybody uses. Uh, we do use, it, it's all into itself. So it's QuickBooks Online with the payroll built in on purpose for us because it makes it easier. Uh, we use Teams internally, um, but we've also in like set up for other people to have them be able to uh, join into the Teams. So I guess we're standardizing that part of it. But from there, it starts to kind of spread out. How about you, Linda? Uh, um, the same way. I have certain tools that I use, like I like HubDoc, but I've been using Receipt Bank with Sarah. Um, I like that one too. I like Auto Entry. I like the other ones, but I use HubDoc on my own because it's one of my favorites. But I use Lucio and I use QuickBooks, but I have some clients that they can't use QuickBooks payroll for whatever reason. So if they're on sure payroll or paychecks or whatever they had to use for whatever their reason is, I will use it because it's not a big deal. Really, with the payroll services, it's not a big deal for me to go in as the accountant and code the app, code the, the accounts and push the journal entry in. They're all the same way when it comes to that. Um, and, and then, like, I, because I use the law firms, I use Lean Law and, and specific ones, but probably a little bit more because I'm trying to do the niching. But when I was a generalist, it was whatever worked for the client in that industry. But it's nicer when you do pick the one because now I can really study and learn it and actually enjoying the learning and getting the time to get into all the nitty gritty of all the law firm stuff. I've got all these blogs that come in and I get all the industry stuff. And it, it's actually, I thought it would be boring and it's not, that was my fear of going to niching was the boredom of it. And I'm not finding that, which is good. Okay. All right. Cause I find that, you know, so I use payroll as a prime example. Um, that so we're wage point fans and so if there's wage point if there's payroll that we have to do it's wage point um and we used to support four different payroll programs and went through the exercise of okay let's so let's think about this usually if our clients have semi-monthly payrolls our team have to do the payrolls all on the same day because all the no matter what payroll provider you use the cutoff date's pretty much the same so on a Tuesday, I've got a team member who's sitting down and has six payrolls that they need to process. For example, the first one is wage point. Second one is paychecks. The third one is QBO payroll. The fourth one, let's say again, is back to wage point. The shift that has to take place in their head to go from one to the next. Yes, they all kind of work the same, but the, the brain shift that needs to take place to shift from one to the next is significant. 
Um, and that's why we've said, okay, if you want us to do payroll, it's wage point. So, um, and, and I know with, you know, with accounts payable apps, some people are using multiple ones and we, again, do the same thing. If we're doing your payable process thing, it's Pluto. Um, you no, know, I, so, I just kind of thought of something that actually, in a sense, this is one of those, another benefits of um, outsourcing. It for me, like, because we set up the, the team the way we do, like, this is not necessarily a fair way to say it, but if there has to be changes like that, we're not, I'm not the one necessarily being directly bogged down by it if we have our team doing that stuff. So that's an indirect, it's kind of like searching for the silver lining pretty hard that way, but. Um, but yeah. aren't you paying them by the hour? Uh, no. Oh, so you pay them by the job. Yeah, okay. we, um, yeah, they, they do, with our company, they do offer either hourly or like project-based. So, but we've been with them for some time and we have quite a few clients. So we've, we've established uh, special pricing with them. Okay. Because if you're paying by the hour, then you are still absorbing that cost somewhere as they're making those switches or learning the new apps. But if you're paying by the project, then absolutely. You tried to trick me. <laughs> well, so then there's a question. There, so there's a question. None of us. Oh, okay, I'm not gonna say that, none of us. How many of us are paying our team by the hour? Maybe this is a discussion for another, yeah, we've got three minutes left. Um, that you're, you're charging your clients a flat rate, but that you're paying your team by the hour. So if they have to make the, sh the shifts um, in the learning, you're absorbing that still yep. somewhere, right? So mm -hmm. that, might be, another, that yeah. might be another topic. Um, for another wine and whiskey Wednesday because we're at eight fifty seven. Okay, and so you know Jacqueline's been so quiet. <laughs> I'm trying to bring you out. I, I know. I I'm just a soul. I don't have a team or anything, and and most of the payroll is done through. I use uh, simple. What is it? Sage for most of my clients. I'm just getting into the QBO. Okay. Well, and, and if you're getting into the QBO, then you're going to be getting into the apps. So think, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about what that business model structure is going to look like for you, I think is going to be fairly important. Isn't it funny to think that, that not that long ago, like this whole app world, app environment stuff, it didn't exist. And I mean, we can have these conversations because, yeah, there's a lot of similarities to the past, but this is, we're still kind of going through the first iteration of a lot of this stuff and figuring out what it means to be a cloud-based accounting firm and having to absorb these changes in the industry, everything else. Bottom line, we could still go back to the green sheets. Anybody want to do that? Matthew, just go back in my day. Back in my day. I get that a lot. <laughs> I still do it for one client. Every <laughs> he has but you don't do that to Tiffany. Every, every month and that's it. And he's 90 some years old. So I don't. Then it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Linda still goes and uh, like literally manually goes and keys in uh, for a couple that's a QuickBooks desktop only, won't do any bank feed. She has to manually type everything in. Can I call him on the way there every time and I go, I hate this. I hate I to type everything in. <laughs> and he laughs and yeah, like just like that. Yeah. And I say every time, you should try vendor sync. <laughs> they won't connect to the internet. Yeah, yeah. that's my guy too. But 90 years old, I'm okay. These people aren't that old. <laughs> okay. All right. So great conversation, everyone. Thank you very much um, for joining us. We're almost at nine o'clock. Um, and hopefully everyone was able to find us in our new location. I know the Zoom link hasn't changed, but the public link has changed. So hopefully everyone was able to find us. And thank you very much again for joining us for another Wine and Whiskey Wednesday. Before you before you go though, Juliet, have you decided on vacation yet? We haven't. We have Ventura. We're trying yes. to add it on to QB Connect when we're there in San Jose. We just haven't figured out where we're going yet. Okay. Go to Ventura. Thanks. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, I know. I'm not just sending me like a no. picture a day. I think um, until we pick a place, oh, which I it, appreciate. They're beautiful pictures. Um, but no, we haven't decided yet. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Have a fabulous week. Cheers, everyone. Have a Cheers. great week. You too. Bye.